It's all too easy to forget that Jesus and his disciples were all Jews. Only after his death and resurrection did the church start to include Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, first through the work of Peter, and then decisively through St. Paul, who preached the good news about Jesus to all and sundry, and found that Gentiles were receptive to it. But in its first few years, the Christian movement was essentially a Jewish group or sect, even if it was, as it turned out, the most successful one. Judaism was very variegated in the first century, and there were other groupings or parties too, such as the Pharisees and the community near the Dead Sea who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what united all of them was reverence for what they called the books, which are what we call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible unlike the New Testament, did not come into being over the course of a single century. The oldest texts in it are probably a few ancient poems, such as the Song of Deborah in the fifth chapter of the Book of Judges, written in a variety of Hebrew that seems archaic compared with most of the rest of the Bible, and may come from the 10th century BC. But most of the books probably started being written around the 8th century BC, which is the age of Homer in Greece, and in Israel, the time of the great prophets, such as Isaiah. The vivid stories of the first kings, Saul and David, in the books of Samuel, probably come from this period, and can be read as you might read a novel, especially in a good modern translation. Large parts of the so-called Books of Moses, from Genesis to Deuteronomy, probably also come from this time, or maybe a little later. A major watershed was the exile of Jewish leaders to Babylon, what is now Iraq, in the 6th century BC. And this also seems to have prompted an explosion of literary activity, with the Books of the Prophets being compiled and edited, and the stories of early Israel reworked. It's probably from that time that we have the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1, which draws on Babylonian ideas about the beginnings of the world. This is the story that is taken so literally by the so-called creationists who defend its accuracy. The Creation Museum in Petersburg, Kentucky, for example, insists that early humans mingled with dinosaurs. A more liberal Christian response has been to say it's all meant symbolically or metaphorically, as the great early Christian writer Oregon already suggested in the 3rd century AD. He wrote, Could anyone be so unintelligent as to think that God made a paradise somewhere in the east and planted it with trees like a farmer? No one, I think, will question that these are only fictions, stories of things that never actually happened and that figuratively they refer to certain mysteries. So says Oregon anyway, but, but, my own impression is that the story of creation was meant literally, it just happens not to be accurate, since no one at that time could possibly have known how the universe came to be. Many other elements in the great historical books of the Hebrew Bible are also legendary or mythical. Indeed, there's probably no incident mentioned in the Bible that all scholars agree in thinking historically true, though we know from archaeological discoveries that the history of Israel as recorded in the Bible does fit into Middle Eastern history. There are Assyrian and Babylonian kings mentioned in the Bible whose existence is not in doubt, given the great hoard of clay tablets from the ancient East that have now been deciphered and published. As well as historical narrative, the Hebrew Bible also contains two other kinds of literature. One is poetry, seen above all in the Psalms. At least some of the Psalms were probably used in the temple in Jerusalem, though some Psalms seem more like lyric poems. Think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, perennially popular with modern Christians. Another genre is collections of sayings and proverbs, which nowadays are usually referred to as 
wisdom literature. All of the Hebrew Bible comes down to us in the end from scribes, even though some of it may have been composed orally, like the Homeric poems. The fact of it having been written down implies the involvement of scribes in its evolution. To speak of the biblical books as products of the court in Jerusalem from the 8th century before Christ onwards may come as a surprise. What about Moses, who probably lived at least four centuries earlier than this? Many people think of the Old Testament as coming from the era when Israel consisted of a collection of tribes wandering in the desert, rather than from the years of dynastic kings ruling over a people settled in the promised land. But let's take just one example, the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that these were given to Moses in the desert, yet they imply a settled agrarian lifestyle. The people they address have houses, do not covet your neighbour's house, and domestic animals such as oxen, and they're told to rest from work once every seven days, which implies that they have farms to work on. These are no desert nomads. They are settled farmers. The commandments have been projected back into the time of Moses, because Moses was seen in later times as the source of all legal authority, just as King David was seen as the sponsor of psalm writing and King Solomon of proverbial wisdom. The books of Moses, so-called, never claim to have actually been written by Moses, it's a later tradition that claims that. It was after some Jews were allowed to return from Babylonia to their own land at the end of the 6th century BC, when the Persians took over what had been the Babylonian Empire, that there began a period of compiling and collecting Israel's sacred writings. By the 3rd century BC, the books of Moses had been standardised and had become the central core of these writings. They're often today called the Pentateuch, the five books. But in Judaism they were, and are, called the Torah, a Hebrew word meaning teaching or instruction, though sometimes translated as law. It's generally agreed that this was the first part of the Hebrew Bible to be regarded as having religious authority, though before long it was joined by other collections, the books of prophets, psalms, wisdom books such as Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, and history books such as Kings and Chronicles. All the books now in the Old Testament were in existence and were respected by the end of the first century BC. Daniel was the last to be written. Large sections of Daniel are in Aramaic, which was beginning to replace Hebrew. They're closely related languages, about as near as Spanish and Italian or German and Dutch, almost mutually comprehensible, but not quite. By Jesus' day, Jews in Israel actually spoke Aramaic, though the more learned could still read Hebrew. The big question is, how did these collections of books come to be regarded as the Bible? The process is actually deeply mysterious. What seems clear is that it was a gradual one. There was never any kind of official council or committee within Judaism that decreed, from now on these are the books you are to regard as holy. It was much more a matter of gradual acceptance over time. For a long time, some books were in a state of flux. For example, among the Dead Sea Scrolls there is a Psalms scroll, that has the Psalms in a different order from the one in modern Bibles, and a scroll of Jeremiah that is significantly shorter and arranged differently. And there were other books, such as what is known nowadays as the Apocrypha, which some people revered but others did not. It may come as a surprise to some that most early Christians in fact accepted the books in the Apocrypha as part of their Bible, but Jews eventually decided against them, as Protestants were to do at the time of the Reformation in the 16th century. Catholics still accept them. For Anglicans, they're half in, half out. 
and if you buy an English Bible, you can get it with or without the Apocrypha. Judaism, on the other hand, nowadays does not make any use of the books of the Apocrypha. It does all seem rather random. Interestingly, and many may not realise this, where the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible is concerned, Jews and Christians have different ways of organising the books, which are quite significant. In Judaism, the Torah, the five books of Moses, are central in a way that nothing else is. In the synagogue, they are publicly read through once a year in their entirety, always from a specially handwritten scroll or scrolls kept in a container known as the Ark. They are taken out and returned with prayer and treated with great reverence. The reader keeps his place using a pointer to avoid actually touching the surface of the scroll, so sacred is it deemed to be. By comparison, the other books of the Hebrew Bible, though sacred, are not treated in the same way at all. They are thought of as forming two collections, the Prophets, which includes most of the historical books, and the Writings, including Psalms, Proverbs and various other books. In a synagogue service, a section of the Prophets is read after the Torah reading, but the aforementioned Writings are not read at all, bar certain books that are read through on occasional major festivals. But even then, they are read from an ordinary printed text, not from a great and holy scroll. We don't know whether this way of organising the biblical books was already current in the time of Jesus or not. On the whole, it seems likely that first-century Jews thought in these binary terms. There was the Torah, and there was everything else and they may not have been agreed or even well informed about what the everything else included. This scenario would help to explain how Christians came to adopt a larger collection, including the Apocrypha. The situation had a certain, shall we say, fluidity. This fluidity applied to the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament too. We know from both Christian and Jewish sources that people referred to passages in the Bible with well-worn formulas such as it is written or scripture says, which they don't use with other books of the period. The New Testament refers often to parts of the Old Testament, but the spread of these references is very uneven. There are far more quotations from Genesis, Deuteronomy, Isaiah and the Psalms than from any other books. Individual synagogues may well not have possessed a complete Bible, but only selected books. Remember, as I said, each of the books was written on separate scrolls. There were no Bibles as single authoritative volumes, so that there could easily be gaps in any particular collection. The Holy Bible, between two covers, as we know it today, was still to arrive. <laughs>